Welcome to uh, our next edition of a very interesting webinar that we have, uh, which is uh, done in partnership with Temenos. And we are looking to uh, cover a very interesting topic today, which is around digital banking experiences in the APAC region, but more particularly on how does it help in accelerating your business in what we now call as the new normal, right? Uh, I think the, the topic in itself is interesting, but we, you know, we also have a fairly interesting panel we, in, in, in the discussion today. Uh, we have with us uh, Ramesh uh, Narayan Swami. Uh, Ramesh uh, is the CTO for Aditya Birla Capital. Uh, he was earlier the group CTO with uh, and group CIOO at the CIMB Malaysia. And prior to which he was also the group CIO at Singapore Post. So he comes with a lot of experience of having worked across the region, be it Singapore, Malaysia, or now India. Uh, we also have with us uh, Sashank Singh. Sashank was, is the group CTO with uh, Validus, and prior to which he was the digital transformation officer at Prudential. And uh, we were just chatting, he has actually had the experience of working around the world, uh, US, UK, Hong Kong, and now Singapore. He comes with a lot of experience, not only in the, uh, in the, uh, digital banking and in the financial services space, he also has done his stint in health tech, which is quite interesting. And, and, and we'll have to hear a lot from him today on how digital adoption has been in a, from a consumer standpoint. We have with us Rohini. Uh, Rohini is the digital strategist uh, looking after the APAC region at Temenos. Uh, she was earlier a director for the center of excellence of uh, global digital banking practice uh, for another firm. And Rohini joins us today from Sydney. Uh, and I am the moderator, I, uh, Ram Kumar. I am the senior partner with CEDA. Thank you again for uh, joining us today. The structure of the discussion today would be for us to have a, a small audience poll at periodic intervals, uh, just to make sure that we uh, gauge your inputs and feedback as we move along. Uh, I know for some of you, this is uh, in people in Singapore, this is the post lunch session. So it's important to keep ourselves awake as well. Uh, we would be having a short presentation from Rohini post, which we will be jumping into a very exciting, interesting panel discussion. So why don't I start with uh, a small poll? Uh, and, and this is for the audience to set the tone for the discussion today. And the question is on your screen what would you rate as the most critical differentiator in apex digital adoption as compared to other regions in what you would think as uh, the primary factor is it customer awareness is it a very progressive regulatory regime uh, is it to do with faster institutional adoption or is it actually just easier access to talent While we actually have the, the audience uh, uh, polling out there, uh, you know, I, I also recognize that APAC is a very fairly large region here. And one of the things that we will be having a discussion around today is uh, the heterogeneous context of this region. And therefore it actually needs to be understood from a, from a contextual standpoint of which country we may be talking about here. We have another eight seconds to go as we close the poll. And uh, maybe Rohini, that will give you the tone for what we will be seeing as the uh, message from the audience before you start your presentation. And I close the poll now. Well, it seems to be a bit of a mixed answer there, uh, but clearly people believe customer awareness is much higher in APAC as compared to many other parts of the world. It talks about how you actually have a more mature customer segment out there in the APAC region. But what is fascinating, and this is a topic I'll pick with you, Ramesh, later, is almost nobody believes that you have easier access to good talent, talent out there, at least as a primary differentiator. Yeah. So on that note, uh, Rohini, I leave the floor to you to help us with your presentation, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thanks a lot, Ram. I hope you can see my screen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Ram, and thanks for joining the uh, webinar today. Um, so what I will talk about in the next 10 to 12 minutes, I want to give a kind of an overview. And a lot of this is based on research um, that different companies have run over the last 
six months as well as our learnings working with different um, banks in the region and globally. So banking has been conducted in the pretty much the same way um, for decades. While some of the legacy processes have been replaced by new tech and the digital capability, much of the foundations since 1970s still the same. The infrastructure and legacy culture places traditional financial institution at increasing disadvantage and compared to digital cloud written alternatives, especially the neo banks and the startups in the industry. So there was a very interesting research on um, what Asians, when Asians were asked, um, and this was run in Singapore and a uh, couple of other countries around uh, Singapore is asked about how the banking will change after COVID-19. So the question was, once the new normal uh, resumes after coronavirus, COVID-19 crisis, do you expect to use the following bank service more often, less often, or the same, um, what you're using during the crisis? And the results were very fascinating. The results of what we were expecting anyway. Um, so the COVID crisis has been accompanied with immense social and economic disruption, as we would see. One of the major changes that came from pandemic was de-risking the traditional distribution channels and a shift to digital. So to some degree, the pandemic actually forced banks to significantly accelerate their shift to digital channels. Banks not only leaned on existing digital, that means internet banking, mobile banking, to enable contactless customer engagement, but also accelerated the path to digitize processes such as eKYC, digital signature collections, online and document submissions. And this is very clearly visible when we see visiting a branch becomes one of the most deterrent in the near future. So, I think more than now, more than ever, we'll always we see the Bill Gates quote from 25 years ago coming true. We need banking, but we don't need banks anymore. Do you think someday we can open a bank account and ask for loan without physically being at the bank? And now the bank is in your hands. So people like you and I live our lives on smartphones. If I want to buy headphones online, I can set up a notification that the headphones, what I want, are really on sale. Just let me know. When I when they are on sale from Amazon or Alibaba, I can be advised and also told about what the shipping cost will be. So if Amazon is quite high, place the order with Alibaba. These customers are controlling their homes from the smart homes app and living their best selves online. Like this webinar, right? Today, this team is brought together from different countries and presenting to a digital audience who is enjoying this maybe in the comfort of their homes. And banks, when customers are used to these experience, they want same, if not better, from their banking organization to see who are securing their future, uh, securing their money. They want these banks to understand that their life goals and recommend as a person, not as a group. And these days, digitally, not coming to the bank. So in 2020, the digital became more important than ever. And it has included a new opportunity for digital relevancy. So digital today is not just an online page or an app. It has a deeper meaning today. It is about automated, digital processes with minimal human touch point. It is a shift for instantaneous search and gratification. We have leapfrogged our way into digital future with three major pushes from pandemic. So end of cash has never been closer. A lot of businesses have stopped accepting cash and have moved to a digital wallet. Square being one of the most used in Asia. So no touch payment. Responsible banking instead of transactional banking. And the final point that we are looking today is the flexibility and security in banking. That's the need from the customers. So banking is going through a shift from the pandemic, but also we are also looking at um, separation of manufacturing and distribution. So generally we look at distribution and channels for managing customer intimacy. Here we care about profitable relationships, driving 
customer advocacy. And then we look at core banking or manufacturing for operational efficiency. We care about the lowest cost per transaction and scalability. Innovation can be in multiple areas, in products, services, or entire business models. What we are seeing is a bifurcation of distribution and manufacturing, driven by regulators from Europe in PSD2, open banking in the UK, CDR in Australia, Hong Kong open banking, Singapore, um, Japan. The shift has led to fintechs truly thinking of their customers and creating services that can assist customer journeys. This has led to an ecosystem play, creating new banks, startups, have come together with interesting and value added use cases to help their customers. Now, if you look at the customer segments, corporate banking segment can be defined by the turnover or just the number of employees, but there's no standard way of defining SME. So, however, some segments are very specific to their needs. So I believe the best way to define the SME segment is by defining their needs. So if you look at sole traders, freelancers, contractors, they are the volume segment. They are typically 65 to 75% of the SME segment. And their significant needs are things like managing invoices, expenses, their accounts and filing tax returns. And then we look at micro businesses to small enterprise. They're between two to 10 people. Their needs can be managing invoices, mainly around cash flows, payroll management, accounting management, and require a wide range of product needs. So accounts, credit cards, loan, credit, invoicing, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe SME is one of a major shift that will look at digital to help them in the next phase of banking. Businesses has to focus on their goals. And running their business, right? Accounting, banking are supposed to help them in running the bank. No one starts a business thinking that they will they would have to do accounting and it will be so exciting. Main objective of banks is to help businesses to run their business better, to be there when businesses need funding and not drown them with their paperwork. The financing and accounting tasks are very paper heavy and, and manual and took a lot of skills on navigation. So the digitization in the last 10 years have moved these businesses to tablets. Then came the software. The software is like Mayo to do the inflows, outflows, inventory management, to do their manage the goods, CRMs to manage customers, ERP to manage invoices, and the banks usually sit outside the journey to manage your money once you've received it and give you loans when you need funding. Now with open data revolution, there is softwares don't have to sit outside in, isol in isolations. They are connected with each other and give a true value of ecosystem. Once the invoice is generated, it can update the accounting software. You can now borrow against that invoice. In one simple click, the banks can be part of this ecosystems. You can guide you how to manage your money better. Banks can extrapolate the data and from all the external peripherals and becomes a bank, um, banking business financial management. Some of these fintechs in the marketplace specialize for SMEs. So we are seeing some of these from um, Acudin is from Philippines, one of the first online marketplace to do invoice discounting in Philippines, and that becoming the market leader for APAC. Then there is funding societies um, from Singapore. So these are the they are P2P lending platform for Southeast Asia. Um, there's Aina from Philippines again, specialized in digital commerce, payment services, and unbanked populations. There is Age Security, which is robo advisor and a mobile stock trading. Um, Quantifeed is automated investment platform, allow banks and brokers and wealth planners to come offer customer digital investment services on one brand. And there are things like VLab, um, which is um, one of the major lending platform in uh, Hong Kong and in Asia, uh, China. So SMEs can be supported from through dig different digital partners in one single platform through banking. So now what is digital with these kind of shift? So true digital 
yes, there is an internet banking, mobile banking, but it requires supporting customer engagement through all touch points, self-service or assisted and seamlessly. So when we usually talk about digital, we talk about three things, digitized bank, digitized customer and digitized ecosystem. And all these three will support to create a true customer digital journey. So let's start with, sorry, the first one, the digital bank. The digital culture cannot occur without rethinking the back office process. So FIs have in place for decades, including a streamlined operations, integrating new data sets, but most impactful transformation occurs with digital customer facing engagement, including products, communication, customer service tools, market strategies. In the end, it is all about creating contextual engagement across multiple channels. So let me give you an example. So one of my friends, an SVP in a major organization, her son just completed university last year. Yeah, the world looked so much brighter at the time. Smart kid, he, was managed, he managed to get three offers from on the uni day, one from Facebook, a major bank uh, in Singapore, and a medical startup. Never heard of the medical startup. So it was very interesting to see which offer he went with. So after days of mom and dad convincing him, go with Facebook, it's well-known brand, go with the bank, it's, you know, working for a bank, it's always beneficial, you, you will learn so much in banking. He disagreed. He went with a startup as he believed it, they, they are doing some groundbreaking stuff, he'll learn a lot more, and they have less outdated process. That was his rationale. It took them two days to send, them, send him an offer. When he requested a specific machine and access to certain technologies, they were able to say yes or no straight away. Whereas in banks and Facebook, because of a hierarchy and structure, it took them months. So more of the experience. If you want to attract young, smart, talented kids and want them to come and work for you, it's more than the brand name. An FI with digital culture can make decisions and deliver results faster since the organization allows automation, is more data driven. Most digital organizations use technology to assist with performing rudimentary tasks. This enables your employees to make complex decisions efficiently. Second is digitized customer. Simplifying all customer interactions with modern technology. A true digital organization focuses on customer experience at every point of contact throughout the entire customer journey. So let me, one of the stories that happened to me, I'm, 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 I'm with this bank for last 15 years, uh, a major Australian bank. And um, when I started here, I started as a silver customer for the credit card. Then they gave me the gold customer. And um, three years ago, I became the platinum customer. So I called up the bank and I say, hey, um, I'm looking for home loans. What can it do for me? The point was like, oh, you, you should get our silver credit card. Um, and this will be the best for you. And it's like, I'm already your platinum customer. And I was like, oh, actually, we don't know that because we have different silos in the bank. So when you left our silver customer um, credit card, we thought you have less, left us as a customer instead of knowing that I'm actually increasing and I've been with the bank for some. So data in silos does not work for them. It's as good as it's not having a data at all. So banks have vast amount of amounts of customer information, but their legacy systems may have prevented them from quickly gathering insights and from data before becoming stale where the fintechs and neobanks have very less data, but are providing real-time engagement. These days, after the fact insights are less valuable as customers are looking for instant gratification. There is a realization that the cloud can create a smooth path forward, enabling big siloed data into seamless systems that can yield data insights without sacrificing security. And finally, the digitized ecosystem. There is evidence throughout the economy that the power of digital, that Amazon has replaced legacy big box retailers while providing small retailers the ability to reach micro segments efficiently. Netflix used to be just a disruptor in video industry. Now it has eyes set in Hollywood production giants altogether. 
The same is true in retail banking, where huge digital players from China or a significantly small new bank from UK or elsewhere are changing the banking competitive landscape. In each case, there is a combination of efficiencies of technology and the focus of improved customer experience that is impossible to achieve with old infrastructure. Banks have started opening doors to the new fintechs for collaboration enablement and add sales channels to their white label products. Again, the bifurcation of distribution and ma manufacturing. Open banking in certain countries is forcing that shift of collaboration and transparency. With the rapid transformation, the financial industry, the banks here have understood the importance of innovation to avoid becoming a part of history, to avoid becoming Nokia. So how can you talk about tech and all the future and not mention the word AI, right? With the future of finance, increasing data and technology-driven AI, AI-led strategies are gaining more prominence. Forward-thinking fintech players um, are playing a huge role in defining the industry standard and enhancing the measures of fight against financial crime. The regulators are never happy to let an organization off the hook if they say our AI gave us this answer. The decision out of given inside a box, even though it's a know-it-all oracle, is not a decision. There needs to be a transparency. So explainable AI is their key. So in most cases, what's required in large scale change? A change in culture, a change in process, and a change in strategy. There's only that is the only way to lead to the next phase of banking where banks will focus on customers enabling by, enabled by products and technology to on demand. Thank you. That was my very quick discussion on what I feel in the uh, future of digital banking. Excellent, Bodini. That was very nice. Digital bank, digital customer, and digital ecosystem. Very, very insightful. I'm sure our, our audience have a few questions for you. For those of you who have any any questions to ask on the basis of what you just saw, you know, feel free to post it on. Uh, you have a button Q and A on your screen. You could actually post your questions, and we'll take them along as we as we move along. Yeah. So time for a small poll before we jump into the panel discussion. Uh, so I have a question for our audience. Uh, which of the following would you rate as the most significant in the APAC digital penetration? Is it digital lending? Is it payments and remittances? Is it reg tech? Or is it transaction banking? Uh, let's see what the audience have to say. But it was quite interesting to hear the, the medical startup story that you shared with us, Rohini. Uh, I'm sure Sashank is very excited to know about it. He actually had his own stint in running a health tech initiative, you know, before he took up this current role. Sashank, wasn't that a... Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well. So uh, we will close the poll in 10 seconds. Uh, I still see that we are 70% people voted. Okay. So let's see what the results say. Uh -huh. Overwhelming 61% of our audience believe that the penetration has been the most significant in payments and remittances. Um, shouldn't be surprising. This seems to be more of a pattern around the world. Uh, and we just ran another webinar you know, for the European market and the, the results were somewhat similar there. So on that note, maybe I will you know, get into the panel and maybe uh, request the panel members if it's possible to turn your videos on so that the audience can see you. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Ramesh, uh, you know, and now that we actually have seen, you know, what we are seeing around the world and some of the audience views also, how would, I mean, you worked in Singapore and Malaysia and India, and you actually have experience around the APAC region. How would you compare or contrast the experiences and the expectations of customers around these countries? I think uh, thanks uh, thanks Ram uh, for uh, for having me here. 
Um, I think Singapore uh, is, is fairly matured. I think, you know, people had access to, uh, you know, significant amount of uh, uh, digital assets for a, for a long time. So I think there the challenge is uh, how do we convert the last 20, 30 percent of the people to, you know, to come onto the bandwagon and then doing it. But also there is always a thought which happens in Singapore is that, uh, you know, there will be always a set of population who will not be willing to come or because of age or because of various other things they don't want. So how do you do, uh, you know, how do you ensure that everyone is included? So I think that is the challenge which uh, Singapore has. Uh, but I think Malaysia, Indonesia, India, I think in my view is fascinating, right? People want to try, okay? You come up with a concept, you come up with a product, I can tell you, right? It is just 100,000 people uh, trying overnight. I mean, we initially launched, uh, you know, some time back, a voice bot to do uh, a renewal for insurance. I mean, the response was just overwhelming, right? What people want to try. But that also puts a strain uh, because whatever you are giving to them no, needs to be perfect from day one. I think markets like Singapore, Hong Kong had the time to perfect themselves. Okay. Now, these countries don't have, don't have the time to perfect themselves, but the customers are very, very keen. Uh, they want to use any kind of product which is available uh, you know, digitally. It is just not in tier one countries, uh, tier one uh, places, tier two, tier three. And I think other thing I'm saying you know, it is across the population range. I sometimes I feel uh, in countries like India, the, the much older you are, you know, the more you want to use WhatsApp, right, than people who are who are younger. So the amount of request we get for, I mean, literally people want to run a bank on WhatsApp. I'm not kidding you, right? That's that's where the country is going, right? Nothing else is required. WhatsApp and with, with a bit of voice and people are saying I'm done. So I think uh, the customer expectations are huge. I think developing markets, it will be a much more uh, a bigger challenge because they have to also catch up, build resiliency and also do it at a cost which is acceptable, right? So, you know, countries like Singapore, Hong Kong can spend a lot of money, you know, to, you know, for the small population, the infrastructure is, is, is phenomenal. Imagine, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're in Thurnal Valley and then you want to do uh, do everything, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a mobile phone, you, you can't have, you know, all jazzy, you know, jibs down, downloading and dancing. So I think uh, I think people will pick up, and I think we are in a very interesting phase. I won't be surprised. Uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, you know, could could lead the way big time. Uh, what's happening there, uh, and and India, I think, will make a difference in this part of the uh, you know uh, this part of the world in the next three to five years. Necessity is the mother of innovation. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's very interesting, Ramesh. Uh, uh, maybe I'll I'll shift gears and move to Shashank. Ramesh talked about countries and, you know, he talked about customers at large, but if I was to slice those customers uh, and look at them from a segment standpoint, and we obviously have the retail customers and we have the corporates and SMEs and, and so on. So how, I mean, if you were to compare or contrast the expectations and the experiences, uh, Sashank, amongst these customer segments, how would you, how would you uh, compare them? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, thanks, Ram, for sort of having me in the panel. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a question which is, uh, which is probably the most asked questions in, you know, in, in a lot of these forums is, a fundamental question is, has the customer experience changed? You know, and, and a straight answer to this question is absolutely yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that sort of, I'll, I'll give the answers in three different folds, right? So three type of segments, you have retail, uh, corporate and, uh, and, and SMEs. Uh, retail generally as a customer uh, experience has evolved for sure, uh, but uh, has it sort of given a very radical shift from uh, what it was pre-COVID era to, to how it is today uh, in the last 10 to 12 months? Uh, not, not a huge, huge uh, sort of swing here. Uh, you know, consumptions are, are probably in the, around the same patterns, you know, um, and we see that the uh, the uh, you know the uh, the overall customer sort of experience around the retail model itself uh, has uh, has changed, but not dramatically. The only thing which I, I, I have personally seen is is again this is a bit regulatory, but 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 equally the way uh, you know, banks also looking around is the norms around KYC itself, right? Because uh, the banks are realizing that you no, know, obviously you know these uh, these customers ain't gonna hit the bank branches right to get the KYCs completed right. So uh, and and this is where you know I think one fundamental uh, fundamental uh, shift which the bank uh, jointly with regulators is you know how to sort of look at a very 
EKYC slash additional KYC related model. You know, make make the make the customer onboarding more 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 smooth and uh, and and clean, right? Mm-hmm. But but equally, right? If you look at you know how things are when it comes to uh, uh, you know the entire uh, payment ecosystem around, and that's what you see one of the polls hiding up as well. The payment surge of payment evolutions, you know, uh, around the retail sector has has blasted off the roof as well, right? So. So yeah, I mean, I I see that the retail segment has moved a lot, uh, uh, but the more dramatic shift, personally for me, was uh, is the SME itself, right? Because you now you look at a lateral shift, left, right, every fundamental pillars the way customer experience was ori- originated uh, in the SME segment has has changed or will be changing as well, right? And I can talk of multiple <laughs> multiple use cases, right, all the way from onboarding you now. Uh, and again, Validus represents uh, you know, uh, a, a space in fintech for SME lending. So I can safely say this, that we are sitting jointly with the regulators and kind of opening uh, you know, board by board and, and, and see where the pain points are for SMEs. Because mind you, because if you look at Southeast Asia economy, right, 50 to 55% and some certain market 60% of GDP is governed by SMEs. If those SMEs are not digitally inclused, Right, and we're not looking at our digitally inclusive uh, SMEs. You know, countries will have a tough time going forward, right? So, government is aware, the regulators are aware, and so does the 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 fintechs and the banks are aware that we got to address the fundamental problem the way SMEs are consuming uh, uh, services. So, I think it's paramount that the experience models have have are are changing uh, dramatically. And I said, no, it's a varied era. The way the the, uh, the 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 experience has changed all the way from onboarding, the way the financing model is going to work, the way it's going to work in terms of the servicing itself, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's great that no, uh, that uh, no, uh, everybody's sort of pitching up to this cause. You know, not just the fintechs, but even see the banks and and relevant financial institutions coming forward to address this 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 impending gap around the. Uh, um, I think one of the things I would like to say on that, Sharon, is, is is fintechs have always been the leaders in these, right? Fintechs started with retail, help retail customers look at the retail pain points. And the banks have to do something because legacy always brings in and they don't want to because it's very hard to do the change. Um, and I think you're so right. SMEs are the most neglected group and still um, um, I can give you examples from Australia where SMEs um, used to have um, private bankers and now banks don't want to have private bankers for SME because they're closing down people and there's less number of people to do the same amount of work. So they don't, they cannot have private bankers. So how do we enable SMEs digitally? So they don't need private bankers and with COVID branches being closed and a lot of work was done through branches, um, it became very difficult. Um, I remember some talking to some of our friends had small eight people businesses. They are not accounting experts. They are not experts in most of the other tasks and asking them to perform those at home without the help of other people was very difficult and until they started finding out smaller fintechs who could help them on those tasks. So I, I think as you said in my, um, need is the main cause of invention. <laughs> Here the need was to help those SMEs in a digital way. And I, I really believe there's gonna be one ecosystem play it has to be one place where I can manage everything rather than going to 10 different apps to manage 10 different things. It's very interesting that you mentioned that, Roini, because there is a question out here from uh, someone in the audience. Uh, he's not named himself or herself. Uh, the question is, as banks become integrated with wider fintech ecosystems, what steps can banks take to protect itself from fraud due to partnering with the wrong fintech and also to protect the security? Seems to be a very interesting question. Yeah. Uh, Shashank? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Go ahead, Roini. Um, so where I've seen is Australia has been a leading uh, place where we've seen a lot of fintechs getting integrated. Singapore, very smart bankers. They actually just acquire the company. Um, where I feel is um, 
in PSD2 or in Australia, open banking, CDR, you can't just go to any fintech and integrate with them. These are, um, they get um, status of called uh, distributors, right? So they, they have to be verified by the government. They check their securities. They check how the data is managed in cloud as, and everything. And then that's the only way they can actually access data of the customer to give you this. So we call them uh, data holders are the banks and the, and the, we have the data receivers, which are the fintechs. Hmm. But is there, a, is there a risk of actually getting a wrong partnership? I mean, it may not be in Australia, but I could see Sushank smiling. You have a view on this, Sushank? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, and again, I can, I, can, uh, I can personally speak on behalf of Validus is, is uh, there's a lot of emphasis today, right, that we are giving the way the credit models are getting reviewed. So it's not no more the same era, which was last year, where the, where the traditional credit models were there, and you kind of looked everybody in the same lens, right? Uh, there, is, there is a definitive need where it's just not looking at the internal data sets. You don't look in only in the internal credit policy, but it's looking at a lot of external data sets, which is getting published now, to consume into this very universe you know, a real-time churning, right? That no, you can't. You can't say that no, I have assessed a, a, a credit behavior in the business. It's going to apply the same credit behavior to other customers. It ain't going to work like this anymore, right? So, it's it's the complexity has changed. You know, as you said, the AML and the and the fraud rule sets also evolving as well. And good thing is, it is just not the you know the roles of FIs or who are coming forward for this. Government and regulators are equally evolving as well. That as the no, economies are sluttering initially, right? You know, there will be a hits of delinquencies hitting on board. So you may have chances where you know, your, your non-performing assets are evolving, your fraud models might evolve as well again and there. So it's just let's 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 jointly assess because you know you've got set up data, you know, third party uh, you know uh, you know uh, the credit credit bureaus have some data as well. So, you no, know, uh, so the government is also coming with some data sets as well. So it's a, it's the role of FIs, right, to to really you know bring under the same umbrella, and uh, and 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 create some uh, some meaningful assets which are which are you know helping the SMEs uh, and, and you know. Uh, I will say, I guess uh, regulation is is key and and it's more a partner than actually a, a, you know a regulator from this from the historical traditional standpoint, and that brings me to a question to you, Ramesh, and. You know, you've obviously been, you know, actively involved or let's say witnessing the evolution of regulation over the years, including some of the recent digital banking licensing models and uh, the sandboxes that are being promoted by the regulators. Your take on regulation as a concept in digital acceleration, particularly in the APAC region. No, no, my, 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 my view will be. Uh, still old fashioned regulators has to be regulators. I think that's how I will start, right? See a few things, right? One, banking is a very serious business, right? It is it is a question of a question of managing risk. Uh, so then it is becomes a question of managing the economy. It becomes a question of managing the the managing the country itself, right? And in everything has got an impact as to how how a country prospers. It depends quite a lot on how the banking systems are. I think where the regulators are playing a fantastic role, I think uh, across, uh, you know, globally, is uh, loosening things which needs to be loosened, right? If, if you if you go back, no, I mean, just you know, this whole branch concept. I was just looking. See, if you really look at the lending side of the business, okay, you actually no need to go a branch. My first credit card in 1996 in India, I don't think I've, I ever visited a branch, right? Because you know why? It's others' money. <laughs> the bank gives the money, but whereas when I want to go put my money, actually, I've got interest to see what. Whether there is a bank exist or not, right? Tomorrow, if I open a Ramesh bank, I don't think there are 97 plus 450. I'm not going to get a single deposit, right? So the role of regulators cannot be undermined. They have got a duty, and I think they are performing well. And I think I like uh, many of them taking a view of saying that you no, know, let me let me figure out a way to create the inefficiencies which is behind the wall. Okay, that's why if you see in Singapore, right, if, if you, uh, you know, you can't have a downtime of more than four, four hours in a rolling 12 year calendar. That's actually a very, very small amount of, uh, you know, amount of time, right? So I think, uh, I think the regulators will, will change policies, uh, will change constructs, which will, which will make the banks more efficient, thereby reducing cost. And they will also see how those benefits can be passed to the customer. And that, that's the reason, you know, 
you know one thing which i wanted which has never happened i know uh, you know many of them don't like me in the industry for that i always feel the regulator should actually regulate the software industry right uh-huh. me as a bank going and buying in software there is an error the regulator puts a gun at my temple and say why are you having this error i said look i don't even own the source code i have not even seen what it is and they actually have told me that's your problem right you figure out a way to ensure that all these things are right right so that's that's first point the second i i, I will say is uh, look uh, you know uh, money laundering terrorism financing are real right i mean these things are not uh, something something to play around with right if if someone is uh, as i always say right if you are able to money launder 2000 dollars i am very sure you can uh, you know you can you can kidnap someone in some part of the world so these things are serious i think technology needs to be responsible we can't be just pushing saying that automate 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 digital 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 when it comes to banking i think we need to work with the regulators uh, we have to be responsible see see remove the inefficiencies in our current organization be transparent to the customer and also take the customer along with our journey and then i think this whole thing will fall in place and and my view is all the regulators are or on that path and then they're doing a, a phenomenal job in pushing the industry it's okay if something takes uh, takes a bit of time right cloud no it has taken its time but now most of the regulators are comfortable because i think they ensure that uh, the ecosystem which is built is built for purpose and built for scale and built for longevity i mean it's interesting uh, again going back ramesh uh, you talked about regulators and clearly open banking for example right i mean is is uh, it falls in the gray area if you like i mean how much of that is within a review of banking fraternity how much of this sits outside the banking fraternity things are evolving right so here's a question from rohit rohit lal uh, and i guess you are best positioned to answer this ramesh do you think open banking is likely to succeed in india and what are the initial areas you think is going to have a real impact your take absolutely if you see right there are there are very specific regulate uh, you know what what they call as aggregator license which has been given to people i think in india the the problem which which people are uh, trying to solve is still identity okay so i think i think if you are able to do open banking and if 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 a bank is able to certify you that you know you have got uh, i've got all your information but i'm willing to give it to for all the services then it becomes easy so it will definitely going to uh, going to pick up from that that perspective because it suddenly makes a lot of things accessible right because of because of the whole aggregator concept it will it will definitely pick up it will it will it will uh, you know it is going to change the way and you know we we spoke about smes right if if you're a if you're an sme looking for a for a loan i think an open banking could be uh, could be very helpful and, and and fairly it is a very big country you know it has got uh, you know too many languages you know it has got too many uh, ways of how people do so absolutely but really from a consumer point of view no i always have felt that open banking has its uh, limited so me as a thing okay i'm aggregating i'm seeing it i'm i'm, I'm doing it but end of the day it is it is still uh, you know as as i always say right what is that service which you want to give so that loop no one has uh, closed it right now i you've got everything open banking aggregated but how people are going to use in the ecosystem is not very sure to me the use cases are small again i think uh, indonesia malaysia india it will pick up singapore it's it's to see singapore i mean i'm saying that you, if you have a atm card of one bank does not work in the other atm right so it is it is actually that siloed okay uh, in unlike malaysia or india for a, for a country which is uh, which is super advanced right because the bank say look you know what bank a or a bank b it is my bank so you can't put in but, but i'm saying first fix that before you fix open banking right it doesn't it doesn't make sense now i have to go and figure out so so i think i think uh, it it will it will be useful time time have to say but i think it is important that uh, you know a lot of these smes needs to figure out a way of how they will use open banking to be beneficial to them i don't think they can wait for the banks or aggregators to do right because there is a bit of regulatory pressure and people are doing it i think let's see as rightly said uh, necessity is a uh, you know mother of invention i think i'm people are going to utilize this very well and hopefully fraud levels uh, stay down and i think uh, there is definitely a use case for it Uh, lovely uh, ramesh and i think this this goes back to rohini the, the the trio that he talked about right digitizing the customer the bank and the ecosystem and here is a here is a question that is aligned to what ramesh says rohini from your experience what are the real challenges that actually come along in digital adoption and you could probably talk about them from all three perspectives the customer the bank and the ecosystem and so i think the challenges um so we work closely with a lot of banks and uh, a lot different banks have a different need and a different strategy 
if you are digitizing a customer, that means all your touch points, but not digitizing your processes, if I fill a form today, a great looking online form, but in the background, it prints out a PDF, which someone else has to type it in into the other system. Is it true digital, right? So it's a process and it's a evolution of all the internal processes as well, right? It cannot be um, front-end digital or a back-end digital. It needs to have low, if you want lower risk and that means lower errors in your process of onboarding, a simple onboarding process, you need to remove all the impedance where human make errors. So have human to verify stuff, but not re-enter my name. I'm, I'm Indian background. Every time they type my name, always there's an E instead of I, there's several errors. So how do I digitize is why do I need to fill forms when we talk about open banking? Why do I need to fill forms when I can enter? Like when I start my, I am a bank A customer and I'm starting a bank B relationship. Why can't I just log into bank A and bank A will give my personal details, my, um, my uh, address, my financial details to bank B. The, the whole process of form filling, I believe is gonna be outdated one day in future. But I don't have to fill forms. I, this is what I want. I put it out in the marketplace. It can be my bank B. And they can gather information from all different banks who I'm customer with to check who I am. Because a lack of uh, social, and they can go to my social to see who I am as a person, mm -hmm. to give me credit, right? To give me credit, to give me loan, or if I um, to open an account or give me a service for any service. So Phil, that's where the end goals are. And to a true digitization, the issues are always been about understanding what the pain points are rather than going with, oh, I want digital, give me a new mobile app, which is quite usual. A lot of times people say, I just need a new mobile app. So why do you need a mobile app? It already does everything you need to do in a mobile app. End of the day, the problem is your bank shuts down after 8 p.m., but you don't do any payments at the time. The payment takes 28 hours to come through. That's the problem. So you need to show. You just talked about um, RTG as being launched to be 24 by 7 in India as of last evening. So I think it's interesting you talked about 27 days there. Uh, Rohini. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Sushank, so there is a question, I guess, uh, from a gentleman, Sinaya Nadurai. His question is, look, I mean, right now we have is the new norms are forcing bank SMEs to actually stop taking bank funds and change the whole business model itself to actually manage the cash flows as the business is rather stuck with banks. What's your view? No, I mean, uh, if you take the lens of the bank, right, I mean, they are doing the right thing. They're tightening the credit policies, right? I mean, they have to tighten the credit policies because there's so much of liquidity available today in the market, right? That, uh, you know, easy money on the floor. So logically what, what, uh, what uh, you know, SMEs are doing is, is is running around and finding where the access the funds are at much cheaper rates, right? So obviously bank, there's a threshold the way, you know, uh, their risk appetite are there and they can't sort of lower the cost of funds as well, right? So, so they said, all right, we have a lot of liquidity available today, but we can't give you that liquidity at the out that used to be before because Today, things are different, right? Because now it's much different the way NPLs are today, you know, delinquency ratios are very high as well and stuff like that. So, so the so point was the moment banks started sort of, started creating a bit of barrier, not a barrier, but more stringent credit policies for the access of funds, they, you know, uh, uh, SME started looking around what the alternate uh, avenue for, uh, for, for the funds are, right? And in that case, you know, you have a lot of uh, fintech companies who are coming forward, P2Ps of the world, saying, okay, we've got an access fund, we've got this whole crowd, crowdfunding infrastructure at probably a little more, uh, a little more uh, interest rates, but these cost of funds are available for you at more relatively affordable prices, right? So uh, I think it's, it's not that, you know, uh, banks are, are letting go their, uh, their customers. It's just that, uh, they're sort of putting one level extra measure to make sure that you no know, customers do have an appetite, not just accessing the fund, but repaying the funds as well, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's just the maker and checker in the behalf, right? And so does these these fintech platform, including validators as well, right? We are a sort of not a P two P, but an alternate uh, financing platform, right? And 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 we have a very clear goal of 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 providing funds in a very well-governed, risk-averse, 
you know, uh, regulated KYC behaved uh, way, right? So, uh, but it's just that our policies are a little flexible and from a, from a credit model perspective compared to banks. So that's the reason you see that a lot of sway of customers are moving in from the banks to us. Uh, we're kind of looking around. And the other thing is, no, uh, and again, this is a, a big argument and discussion when you look at the regulator sitting on the table. It's a, a fundamental question. A fundamental question is, it's just not an SME asking for funds. SME is asking the fund at the moment of time. Right. Right. What is the theory for your dispersal of funds? Right. And we come back and say, by the way, my KYC process is going to take me two days and your loan approval is going to take me five days. By the way, no, by the time you apply for funds, I'm going to give you an in 10 days time. It's too late because they're looking around furnishing a fund in a working capital behaviorism on a relatively real time basis. Right. So, so it's just not an access of fund credit policies at the board moment, the funds can be disbursed. The theory is going to measure as well. Right. And that's where I think these, these, uh, these fintech platforms are really coming up the curve because you no, know, the technologies are much mature. The way they onboard the customers, the way they assess the risk and disperse the funds are, are much shorter. In fact, for validators, the entire process takes us roughly around 12 hours by the time this person goes out to the customer. So, so it's just the way I think uh, I know the evolution is happening. And I don't think there's a cat fight between the platform providers and the banks. I think both are supplementing each other. Uh, but it's it's the change which is which is which will stay for for some time now. Yeah, it's it's the new adage is going to be the banker in need is the banker indeed. Yeah, so you know it's all about timing and giving away the money at the right point of time to the SMEs, and that's well exactly. Said. Look, I mean there are a couple of related questions. A little bit of crystal gazing for you here, Shashank, and I think there's a question from Abhishek. Uh, who says, do you see banks getting into non-banking business to survive this cutthroat competition? And there is another question here, which is, uh, do you also see uh, digital banks, and this is from Ashish, uh, you know, with digital banks propping in the ASEAN, we see a lot of established traditional banks planning to or already in process of launching new digital, branded digital identity to target the digital savvy millennial customers, do you think that will eventually lead to traditional banks over the years, completely migrating to, to digital banks? Crystal gazing, but your take. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I fundamentally, you know, struggle to answer this. You know, the first fundamental question I always say is, in fact, this is a question on a question is, what is a digital bank? What qualifies a digital bank? You, you call, OCBC additional bank, you call TBS additional bank. What, what are the criteria defining the additional banks are? See, for me, one fundamental way the measurements are, okay, if you're not providing a digital inclusive services for your end customers in a much more optimized way compared to a new bank, you're no more additional bank. You might be a great bank with a lot of apps, a lot of great digital assets on the floor, but if services are not digitally inclusive, and if services are not optimized for the need of consumers, you know more additional bank anymore, right? Banks are realizing this, right? Now, I'm not just the banks in Singapore, but Southeast Asian markets, and probably Ramesh can obviously speak on behalf of Siam and the rest as well, right? That they are realizing that it's no more an option, right? I mean, new banks are gazing at them, fintechs are gazing at them, right? It just, they have to evolve. If they can't, right? It's just a matter of time they have to shut down the doors, right? So uh, probably the measure you can augment my response, but I think, do I see a threat for traditional banks? No, because amount of amount of liquidity and, uh, and 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 reserves they have. But do they have option not to evolve? I, big no. I mean that's my take. No, absolutely. I think I think the challenge for the traditional bank is look, end of the day. You know you have to, you have to give something back to the shareholders right now if you keep on doing in the current way i think the value gets eroded i think that is the biggest problem still they might service still they might have segments but i mean we have seen right most of the banks struggle to push their stock price even by a dollar up right even even being doing lots so that is i think is the thing how the market looks of these these banks so hence i think those changes uh needs to come in and banks will uh will evolve and I think banks also is seeing, you know, how do we be a part of the ecosystem? See, you see, you know, if, if you see any payment or a loan is actually the small part of a huge transaction. But the point is, if that transaction didn't happen, the other part doesn't happen at all, right? So now I think that is where banks are trying to insert themselves at the at the right uh, at the right place. 
the, some of the digital banking models for SME in Singapore, the new banks are absolutely great. It's just not me providing loan. Uh, can we provide them accounting services? Can we build uh, e-commerce websites for them? Can we do the delivery for them? So that whole thing, wherever it needs to come as a package, I think that is how it will come. So it will be definitely an ecosystem play. Uh, you know that will uh, that will attract uh, you know people to uh, people to uh, work with, and the other point which was made, you know, how do you you know how do you remove inefficiencies, right? I mean, two examples which I always say, you know, we spoke about forms. If you really look at a credit card form, you know, always it'll have Mister, Miss, Missus, and all those things, right? The next one will be male or a female, because <laughs> the problem is you had a thing called as doctor before. So hence, you can't figure out whether it is male or a female. I always tell people, can you please remove the doctor? The form becomes much easier. Right. So, so you, you know, people never thought, you know, that way, but made it very complicated when you lose your card. Right. I mean, I can remember there was a conversation in 2000 in city. Uh, should we give an option for the customer in IVR say block my card? But the whole debate was what happens after 10 minutes, if the customer comes back and so, oh, you know what? I actually misplaced the card. I found my card. So I want to cancel my cancellation. And I tell you, it, it was a debate for months because we could not figure out how to solve it. But today we have solved those kind of problems. Right. And that is where the banks are and banks are inching from a checkbooks. Right. I always say China never had checkbooks. I mean, we are still trying to figure out 2025. I mean, the amount of checks we use in Singapore is absolutely insane. Right. Everyone will. I mean, I, I never had checkbooks. So I had trouble. Now, hopefully all the So I think all those things comes together. I think banks have to change, uh, give be a part of the ecosystem, like exactly what uh, was given in the presentation and then take all customers along. That's important. We can't. Uh, we can't leave. I mean, I, again, I don't know how many of you have said, right? I, I've figured out, right? In 40s, I, I have started pressing my phone very hard. And some of us think, why are you pressing it so hard? It, you just need to touch. But I can't feel it. Right? It's, it's a problem of age. That's how the human body behaves. As you age, you know, you, you will do it. Now, the question is, how do I deal with it? And so I think, and imagine a population of around, uh, you know, a bulk of 70, 80 people who have come through it. Actually, I don't think we have got a lot of solutions sorted out, you know. So let's see. I mean, I think it's going to be a fun world. We'll live in, we'll all see. And hope Ram will run another panel in 15 years. We'll be oh, still discussing. Know, and, and, and you know, people around the world, you know, uh, Ramesh and I went back to school together in uh, Bitspilani. And back there, those days, it's called as a lacha session. So we'll have another one again, Ramesh. But here is a question for you, uh, Rohini, specifically directed to you from a gentleman called Fahad. And his question is, going back to what Ramesh said, what is the role of branches in the era of digital banking? That's a tough one. <laughs> no, um, so I always compare from the leaders on tech, right? So uh, look at Apple, Microsoft. They have their big stores, humongous stores across the world, but they are not stores to sell. They are, they are stores to help people. So they run classes, how you how you can do better with your laptop, you can book in time with the Genius Bars, or their stores as a lifestyle stores where you go and you feel the products before you buy them. So they, they completely revolutionized the way how you look at stores to sell versus Apple store is not to sell, it's more a lifestyle store. So looking same in branches, I think branches will become more of when you need a human to confirm something or have a financial advice to feel that you are loved by your bank, you go to the branch, they will not, they will be a consumer place where it's not just one bank, you are, but you may be using some of the third party services on your digitization journey, right? You may have accounting from zero, or you may be using um, a small uh, fintech. So they may have presence of all those in one place where you can go talk to someone, understand how to use your, um, as an SME, how to do accounting run classes for your people to do better, right? So I feel the future of branches is not just to sell you new products. It will be a new way of banking where you're helping your customers. But that's my view, maybe oh, completely. Cool. Right? Yeah, might, might be. I just want to add uh, one view on that, right? Which I think uh, is, is created a challenge. See, previously we had, whenever we had very simple problems to solve, we went to the call center, okay? Uh, when the problem became much, bigger, much bigger, we went to the branch. See, now what has happened is the entire simple problem from the call center has migrated to the app. But the complex problem, no, it has not moved from the branch to the call center. Because call center, we still, you know, hire very junior people, train them. But if you are able to get customer service over phone, which is still human touch, to solve complex problem in a nice way, I think, I think then the branch would be really in question. Huh? 
today that yeah. complex problem solving still happens in branch and once if someone cracks that i think i think uh, why we need a branch will become a huge huge question mark i still see yeah. and then there is talking about community centers becoming like i mean these are pre covid days of course where actually branches actually are not just about branches but actually you can go and have it's like a we work office you can sit there right right uh, you know it's it's interesting in fact while we continue our conversation i, I know we are we've clocked our uh, time here uh, i do want to go to the last poll and this time around i really want the panelists to also vote uh, because it is a question that actually will help us understand what would be the best barometer to measure the digital maturity of a bank and fortunately or unfortunately all of the above is not a choice uh, here so you have to choose one of the four so is it a digital onboarding is it about digital offering is it about digital fulfillment or is it about digital engagement the jury is still out there and we have another 60 seconds to go Where do where do I see the question? I know I'm asking a very uh, I can't see I can't see the poll. So has it got popped up uh, on the in the screen itself? Strange, yeah. And for me, it doesn't. Anyway, so I'll, I'll tell my answer. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, probably prefers more virtual of Ramesh rather than no. <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, Ramesh, I would want to add there was an Italian bank which cracked, uh, tried to crack the problem of moving the branches out. So what they did was screen sharing with video chat. It was very interesting because they didn't have enough money to put up hundreds of branches. It's leaving quite right. a big country and small. Um, so what they did was they had uh, video chat where they'll do their facial recognition to make sure that the same human they're talking to you by ID verification before discussing anything financial. And on top of that, they had smaller uh, kiosk where they can do video converse conversation. If you don't have a laptop, instead of going to a branch, they had smaller kiosks um, in shopping malls, so you can book your time there. go and do a video chat with someone and they'll they'll be able to access their accounts and give you full it was very interesting i'm not sure why it didn't filter through in other countries but yeah non bank tax accelerating accelerating big time okay time to uh, declare the results of our poll and it's about having a wider canvas of digital engagement okay so as rohini you rightly pointed out it's not about just having the onboarding experience but offering a fulfillment but about everything that's yep. it's that is being encompassed ramesh yeah. would that be your answer yeah i'd add one to that <laughs> <laughs> all right okay i think we will have to unfortunately all good things come to an end and you know this was a lovely conversation i really enjoyed this extremely power packed intense discussion thank you ramesh thank you shashank and thank you rohini for thanks thanks ram thank, thank you thanks for joining us please post them to us and we'll make sure they get forwarded to the panelists